All right. So this week we're joined by Dan Aguire from the Bar Room Network. And uh, yeah, Dan, if you want to tell us a little bit about it. Oh, well, I've been doing the Bar Room for about, what, five, six years now. I work with Mr. Aldo Gandia. And you gentlemen have reached out to me a few times. And finally, uh, we're making it work. All right. Well, keep in mind, all this is on available on demand. If for some reason, you know, life is complicated, people have kids, I get it. You can't necessarily watch on YouTube whenever things are happening in the moment. But Tooch has got weekend sports betting Friday night. Again, if you can't watch, it'll be available on demand. Greg Gabriel in the house on Monday mornings. Again, he used to be in the Bears front office. So it's always, uh, you're listening to a guy that's connected, even so he knows people that are still there. You got Draft on Tap with Danny Shimon on Wednesday nights. He's the ballroom guru for watching the tape and such. And then there's Aldo and me on Tuesdays with Bear Their Souls. It was Halloween one year, and me and my friend went to Arizona. We went to go see a concert, Tool and Primus, um, which was badass. But, uh, we, you know, walking around on Halloween around uh, ASU, Arizona State University, you got all these college kids everywhere, and I was just wearing my Jay Cutler jersey. And, man, fights were breaking out around me from people arguing about Jay Cutler. They would just see my jersey, say something, like, oh, Jay Cutler sucks, and somebody else would be like, no, he doesn't, and this is it. And I would just sit back and just just watch. Man, people people are emotional. And, For you know, record, even when the Bears Jay are – fucking rocked. It, yeah, he, he was pretty damn good. I love Jay Cutler. I know a lot of people don't. It, it's so weird at the, the Week 4 game in Chicago – I was seeing Denver Jay Cutler jerseys at Soldier Field. I didn't expect to see that. Ironically, I had a Cutler jersey on that day too. I had the the uh, night the old nineteen forties throwback, the one is blue with the orange C that they quit wearing after the seventeen season. I was wearing that one, uh, but yeah, I loved Cutler. Most people don't that I talked to on any of these shows, so that's interesting that you like Jake as well. Yeah, well, I mean, statistically, he's been the best quarterback we've had you know, in recent times, I mean, you know, I'm 35 years old. So like I was born in 88, I don't, not even in this country, like I don't, 85 Super Bowl. It's all stories to me. Um, so everything I've known as a Bears fan, yeah, Jay Cutler has been the best quarterback we've had. And he's had, a, you know, when he got here, I mean, his number one wide receiver was what, Devin Hester? Johnny Knox is number two. He had a shit offensive line. You know, it got to a point where they were able to build that offense up for him. I know Mark Tressman's second year, the year that the defense set up three 50 pointers in a row. Right. Um, 20, but that offense, that offense was projected to be a top five offense. And I'm pretty sure they somewhat lived up to it. But just, just a little experience. Me and David went to the home opener that year against the Vikings, and it was pouring rain. We're sitting under. Uh, so he threw the touchdown to Martellus to win it, right? Wow, good yeah. memory, dude. Look at you know, it was terrible weather. It was pouring rain. We're sitting under the Jumbotron, and I heard that the game got blacked out for a couple minutes on the broadcasts on TV. So people didn't get to see this, but we got to see this live. And this is when I, I knew this whole thing was fucked right during that game, during week one, because I believe we were either going for a touchdown at the goal line or it was a two-point conversion at the goal line, and they had come out in like a tight formation, one wide, Brandon Marshall out there. And the defense came out with the personnel to to accompany that. You know, they're coming out with heavy set personnel. And all of a sudden, we split Matt Forte out wide. All of a sudden, we split Martellus Bennett out wide. All of a sudden, Jay Cutler drops back in a shotgun. And now you have three wide shotgun, and the defense is looking around like, fuck, fuck. And you hear whistles, play gets blown dead for some, like, time clock bullshit, not even a penalty. The refs are just like, oh, you got to adjust the clock, this and that, replay the down. And, and what do they do? They come out in a tight formation, <laughs> one wide. <laughs> and this time the defense like comes out in nickel. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I was just like, you can't, like, ah, it, the idea was there, but you can't just sit there and pretend you're going to fool them after you, you know, I don't know. I always think like it's kind of funny because when I think of Jay Cutler, I fucking love Jay Cutler, but my biggest memory of him is the D'Angelo Hall like four interceptions, four picks against Washington, just like yeah. where he's just like I'm better than this guy, fuck this guy, and it's like eh, I don't know about that man. You throw him four picks, but um, was the there like four about, picks against Green Bay in his opener as well? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, but you know he came back and threw a touchdown to Devin Hester in the second half, and the Bears were in that game. They only lost. Oh, yeah. it was, it was what, like something like 
Off the top of my head, I don't know, but it was close. The D'Angelo Hall game, 17 to 14. So yeah, you're you're right there. I was talking to somebody where they said, you know, I'm, I'm I hope Caleb Williams is a nice guy. And I was like, I don't know really why you care. Because we started with Jake Culler and he was an absolute dickhead. And everybody loved him. And then after Jay Culler, we kind of overcorrected and started getting like a bunch of nice guys. I remember Kyle Orton, and I remember thinking just like, Kyle Orton's like a really nice guy. And I, I kind of wish, like that's my opening season of fandom was 2005 against Carolina playoff season. Oh, right? Where, like, Charles Kyle Tillman Orton, got smoked in that oh, fucking game by Steve Smith. I remember just being like, I don't, somebody was telling me I, it was my neighbor or something like that. Like, I hope Caleb Williams is just like a nice guy. And he, you know, he fits in Chicago. And I was like, I hope he's a fucking dickhead, but he wins 12 games a fucking year. Like, that's how I thought. Yeah, Trubisky was a nice guy. Yeah, and we had to turn off ESPN in the uh, in the team yeah, facilities because he was yeah because we he couldn't handle criticism. And then Justin Fields is like the nicest guy, and that's why I think like people uh, tend to you know hang on to Justin Fields for a while. It's like he had flashy plays and he was fun, and so it's like it's fun to watch, but you probably should move on from that. And so like in my head, I was just like, man, I'm used to these nice guys the last five to seven years you know i had mitch for five for three four years and he was a nice guy and i hope he would step up and get better and better and you know then we got justin and he was even cooler and nicer and you know made even cooler plays and now i'm just kind of like you know what i want a dickhead i want aaron Rodgers. i want somebody who like shuns their family and you know i don't know does some crazy outlandish shit but he wins 12 games a year i hope he's a dickhead but he's just like an awesome quarterback. And that's well, where I'll go, I think I'll, Jay Cutler, you know? I'll go back to Jim McMahon, and McMahon was a guy that a lot of people would say was an asshole from the outside, but his fucking linemen loved him. Like, his, the offense loved him. And, you know, like I said, his pals were the five guys up front. So, and, and not to contradict you or anything, but I think that that's what I liked about Fields, not so much that because his linemen sucked for the most part, but it felt like the team was at least behind him. And then if you recall that Falcons game on New Year's Eve with the crowd is chanting, we want fields, we want fields. I thought that there was a chemistry that the Bears hadn't had at that position in a really long time that the players are really behind him. Now, Jay had, you know, early on he had Greg Olson that loved him, and then Brandon Marshall loved him when he loved him and hated him when he hated him, and Kyle Long loved him. But for the most part, he's sort of standoffish, you know. But again, he's a type 1 diabetic. He's always dealing with his blood sugar and He's got other things he's constantly having to stress about on the sidelines, so he's not really cheery, and I get that. But I, I, it did seem like the team was really behind Fields, and maybe that doesn't mean anything. But it felt like they had a chemistry, and it, the Bears haven't really had good chemistry in years. But again, comparing it to McMahon, is from the outside, people may have said, oh, he's an asshole, he's arrogant, but his teammates loved him, though. So if Caleb Williams could get the respect of his teammates – and have them play hard for him. I think that's what I'm looking for. And if he's, if he thinks I'm an asshole for wearing his jersey, then so be it. I mean, that's fine as long as we win. I think at the end of the day, to like kind of summarize what David's saying, and like, dude, I think what we all want is production from the quarterback position. And I think we've gotten to a point where, like, to me, nothing, nothing else matters. Like, I need production from the quarterback position. I need a guy to go out there and you know, beat some of these records we we've had, like only team without a 4,000 yard passer. I mean, this has gotten to a point where it's embarrassing. It the really most is. touchdowns by a player as a rookie in team history goes back to 1942 and it's 11 for a quarterback in his rookie season, 11 touchdowns is the team record that he, he's got to break that this year. Maybe even the 4,000, yeah. but definitely the 11. Come on. He's got to break that. You know, the so worst like, moment other than Jay getting hurt. And then everyone's saying he didn't have balls because he was fucking hurt. And I remember Olin Krutz saying that Jay came back to the huddle and his leg is shaking involuntarily. And he literally couldn't stop. His leg was throbbing and shaking and he couldn't put any weight on it. And that's why he went to the sideline to try to work it out. And people were calling Jay like, you know, a coward and all this, which is just completely egregious. But the worst moment of that game was that, and look, I'm 6'5", 300 pounds myself. I mean, but... This pick fucking guy, that, fucking that pick tackle. six from the 400-pound man. Oh, my God. Ben, Raji, something, Benji Raji, whatever yeah. his name, BJ Raji. BJ Raji. Oh, Dude, that, God. That's, that's how you trick rookies, you know what I mean? You drop back the defensive tackle in the coverage. Like, come on, man. 
that's an easy read. It's a very easy read. I will argue to you all the worst one wasn't even the the championship game. The worst one for me was three years later, week 17, Green Bay, Chicago. The winner makes the playoffs, wins the division. The loser's out. We're up 28 to 20, and eventually... Yeah, it's four. They had four straight fourth downs. They got they couldn't get off the field. Julius Peppers has a chance to to keep contained, doesn't. And Rodgers hits Randall Cobb, and Joe Joe Buck's call was just Cobb and touchdown on like with what twenty seconds ago, fourth and thirteen or whatever. And that that's the only time in my life I threw a remote and broke it when Cobb scored. And then my wife at the time was like, you know, you're a fucking idiot. And she was right, which made it even worse that I broke the remote and she was talking shit to me. And that was like the worst law. I mean, that, that's right there, probably the worst, most painful, even more than the Super Bowl in some ways. Well, that hurts for me. Like, if we're talking painful memories here, I, man, this has turned into a therapy session real quick, right? Um, I, the one that replaced in my head, I was dating a girl. We went to a party, some child's birthday party at her family's house. And it was like week seven or eight against the Chargers. When was Jake that when Color broke his thumb? Fucking ran down his pick six. And oh, broke, yeah. Um, and I I couldn't contain myself like in public. And The worst part about that is, you know, they put Caleb Haney in there a couple weeks. And eventually Josh McCown wins one game. They were seven and three when Jay got hurt. Because remember, they beat the Chargers there too. And I think they were uh, they, one and seven, right? Yeah, they 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 finish eight and eight. But if they go nine and seven, they make the playoffs, and Jay could have come back from his surgery. But furthermore, you had Donovan McNabb, Chicago boy, on the fucking radio every week, basically begging to come back and give me a chance to play for my my hometown team. Please sign me. Please sign me. There's no way you can't tell me if they sign McNabb at, what, 35, he can't come in and win two games instead of Caleb Haney? 